Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. We're so happy that you've joined us and that we have this time together this morning, just worshiping the Lord and learning together. And, and it's Communion Sunday. I'll say that again. It's Communion Sunday. And so we're going to be doing that together this morning as well. So if you need a minute to just run and and um, get something to use as use for the bread and something to use for the cup, please, please do that. And um, towards the end of the service, we'll be sharing in that meal together. Just want to start off this morning by reading to you from Isaiah 49. Pastor Todd is continuing in his series this morning about journeying in the heart of God. And last week we talked about justice, and this week we're going to be talking about mercy. So listen with me to these beautiful words from Psalm 49. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. So let's, let's come together this morning and let's, let's be welcomed by the God who desires to welcome us. In shackles and chains, I came to your door and fell on the floor of mercy. Guilty I stood, guilty I was, I couldn't hide my shame. Just as I am, just as I am, Jesus, you welcome me, you took me in, I'll never be the same. Okay. 
prayer right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who welcomes your children home. We thank you that you are a God who pursues us and who dresses us in your righteousness for your name's sake. So God, we come to you this morning grateful that we can be together and grateful that you are always with us and that you are always welcoming us home. And we thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you made the way open to the Father, that the Holy of Holies was just thrown wide open, and, and that we can now come to you together to the Father and call, we can call you Daddy, Father. We can crawl right up into your throne room and be with you. So we thank you, Jesus, for that miracle that by your life and your death and your resurrection, that you made a way and you are the way and you are the truth and you are the life. And we declare that, we declare that to each other and we declare it to the world that you are the way. And we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you suffered for us. And we want to remember you this morning. So thank you for your body broken. Thank you for your blood spilled. Thank you that as you gave up your life, you gave us life. And Lord, I just pray that as a congregation, as a community, we would live that life fully and abundantly in you. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence inside of us, that you are always with us. And so, Holy Spirit, we just ask that there would be less of us so that there could be more of you, that we would begin to resemble Jesus and that we would be your hands and feet to this hurting world. So we commit this morning into your hands. We just want to spend this time with you. We want to bless you, and we want to receive your blessing because you are a good God. And we, we want to just learn of you. We want to remember you, and we want to be changed by you. So we, we offer you this time that we have together, and we pray that it would just be the beginning of another week of journeying with you, of hearing your voice, of knowing you, and of being discipled by you. So we thank you and we praise you, Father, Son, Spirit, and, and we rejoice. We rejoice with you in all that you've done. So, Lord, would you guide us through the rest of the service and, and uh, in our time, even as we leave this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Just thinking about how that last song that we sang together just reflects a little bit on the story of the prodigal son, which is, is such a story of mercy, of a son who just said, I want my inheritance, and I want it now, and then took it and wasted it. And um, when he finally came to the, the very end of himself, he realized that even the servants in my father's house are, receive better treatment than what I'm experiencing right now, where I've brought myself to. And so when he, when he found his way home, he knew, he knew that he was no longer worthy, and that's what he said to his father. But his father had already come running to greet him, dressed him in his best robe, put a ring on his finger, and then just had a huge feast to celebrate that his son who was dead was alive again. His son or his daughter, because we know that that son refers to both of us, male and female, that the one who was lost was found. And so um, as, we, as we enter into thinking about the mercy of God, learning about the mercy of God, let's just experience the mercy of God as we sing this song together, that his desire is to set us free and to dress us in his robes of righteousness and to call us his own. Grace runs deep While I was a slave 
You know, in a world where, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of people know believers who, more by what they're against than what they're for, is such a messed up way that we've communicated the message of Christ because Jesus came to bring us freedom, and it's a freedom that the world can't give. So we need to take our eyes off of the world and set them on Jesus. Because in this world, Scripture tells us we will have trouble. But Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world. So let's not be so concerned with the outer things, and let's take a look at Jesus and what he says. Romans 8 said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that love was made perfect on the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's what we celebrate. That's what we cling to. That's where our freedom is found. And so let's be a people who let the world know that there is freedom, there is hope, there is life, and it comes through Jesus. in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested in my life
was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life began. You know, we were talking last week about justice and the demands of justice and that the demands of justice have to be satisfied. And so we can't satisfy those demands. We are called to be people of justice, but that justice of God, he satisfied himself because our God is both the covenant maker and the covenant keeper. And he makes covenants with us and he knows, he knows that we are not great covenant keepers, but he is. And so from the beginning of creation, he knew when he created us that he would also be making a way for us, that he would take those demands of justice on himself so that we could live in the grace and the love and the mercy that he desires for us. And in that Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, there was a mercy seat that that blood was poured onto that mercy seat, and only once a year did the high priest even go in. And yet, when Jesus died, the veil was torn in two, and the Holy of Holies was opened up because Jesus took care of the demands of justice so that we could benefit from the incredible mercy and grace and love of our God. So let's sing one more song together that just reminds us of all of these things then let's praise him. From the depth of your heart, let's praise him, Father, Son, and Spirit, the God who makes a way for his people, the God who desires to, to move us into freedom, even in this world, so that we can enjoy freedom with him eternally. So we praise you, Father. We praise you, Son. We praise you, Holy Spirit. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three Redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Christ 
was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not yield, shall not fade. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected, the question, where do you need God to work in your life right now? Or maybe more to a point, if God himself were to ask you, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? What would your answer be? And how would you expect him to answer? Is he judgmental, critical, or compassionate and merciful to you? For those that have been journeying with us over the summer, we're in a series of drawing near to the Father's heart, looking at some attributes of God and how that impacts how we relate to him. This morning, we're looking at the idea of the Father of mercy, that is, God reveals himself as our Father and a Father of mercy. And we've got a couple of passages that we're going to look at to start the message, all the while hanging on to that question, what would we want God to do for us right now, right at this moment? The first passage we'll look at is a little bit longer one. I invite you to read along, if you will. I'm going to be in Psalms 103, verses 8 through 18. And then I'll look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1.3. The reminder for those that are familiar with us today is our communion celebration day. So if you don't have a bread or a cracker and a juice or cup or something, you can get that ready because we'll, uh, we'll look to end the, the message with that. But Psalm 103, starting with verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love, is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove transgressions from us. As a father shows compassions to his children, so the Lord shows compassions to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Psalm 103, 8 to 18. And the other verse that we'll be looking at this morning is from 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. As we looked at Psalm 103, it says, For the Lord is merciful. We hear and see in 2 Corinthians 1 3, the Father of mercies. What do we mean when we talk about mercies and this idea? This English word that, that is translated from the biblical concepts into primarily the words of compassion or mercy. What, what do we mean? Oftentimes I think we can have an idea, but to just shape it in our heads again. Mercy, from, from Oxford Languages Online, mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone, now catch this, whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Huh. Merriam-Webster Online, mercy 
Is compassion or forbearance, forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one who is subject to one's power? Also lenient or compassionate treatment. Another version for that is compassionate treatment of those in distress. And then a Bible dictionary picks it up and it sort of pulls these same ideas from English, but it starts to shape a little bit more the theology. It says, compassion for the miserable. <laughs> its object is misery. So it's starting to offer that this idea of the one in power gives mercy and then there's, there's a misery, that there's a sense of, of, of suffering or, 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 or a state in the person. And then one more Bible translation for mercy. It says, mercy is a distinctive Bible word characterizing God as revealed to men. Now, we would trust on a Bible commentary to actually say mercy is a distinctive Bible word characterizing, characterizing God's, God as revealed to men. But we want to hang on to that. We want to believe that because even as we look at the, 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 the Oxford or the Merriam-Webster that we pulled off available online, is when it's from someone in power to punish or to harm or, or someone over, that is subject to your power. We're like, who are we talking about? Because ultimately we have this idea that whether it be bosses or parents or, or, or governments, we, we can get free of their, their, of their power or their influence for the most part. And this mercy can, can come or go, but I want us to hang on to this idea that mercy is, is this word we see in the Bible characterize, characterizing God's character as he reveals himself to us. And so that even for those that have been on the journey with us over the last few weeks, that we talked about it with goodness and justice, that we get really our English understanding, certainly within the Western world as it's been shaped, from the mercy of God. We understood with good, that we get our concept of goodness from God. We get our concept of justice from God. And that shapes other things. Even, even those that, that don't want to submit to God or, or, or don't believe the Bible's there, that that influence is there that shapes the English language and the way we use these words of goodness, good, just, justice. And for us this morning, mercy or compassion. And so when we hang on to that, and even I think as we listen to the definitions, that there's something there that we want to grab a hold of, and if you're just visiting with us for this message, as we say that mercy is a part of who God is, that God is merciful, you don't necessarily have to agree with it. You just hang on, this is what's going to shape our discussion together this morning, is that God is merciful. That even our concept of mercy, of how we process it, how we engage it, comes from who God is. And in what we read this morning, we, we saw it right there at the beginning of that psalm, Psalm 103.8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And as we read that idea of the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that's the ESV version. A couple other English translations, just as we pull from the Hebrew, this concept, is that the, the, the New King James Version says the Lord is merciful and gracious, very similar, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. So they take that steadfast love and they make that equated again to mercy. And so this is who God is. That is, God inspires the psalmist to hold on for the faithful people of God, that God is merciful. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love or mercy. And the NIV version, which many of us use, is the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. So that we have this idea that merciful or compassionate. And as we bring those ideas and we try to think of them, I'll confess sometimes when I get my theology that as I've been in the, the sort of evangelical church for 30 years with truth and theology, it's like, wow, some of this feels a little soft around the edges. Like I know it's true, but it's a little bit soft, but, but compassionate and, and merciful and gracious. Well, it's nice for the psalmist. We don't really see that in, in, in other places, do we? Well, yeah, we do. And one place that's great to, to push us for is that even in, in a book that, that, that many have found to be hard and, and, and sort of tough to wrestle with is in the book of James in chapter 5, 11. It says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, talking about perseverance of the saints. And you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And again, it's not that God sometimes shows compassion and mercy. It's not that God occasionally when he's forced to is, 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 is compelled to be compassionate and mercy. 
but indeed his very nature is one of compassion and mercy. And because he is compassionate and mercy, he acts compassionate or with compassion and with mercy or merciful. And again, just to, to, for those of us that are maybe trying to think of this idea, okay, well, we see that in the New Testament, but other than the Psalms, God in the Old Testament was not really that kind and merciful and compassionate. Well, that's, that's a bad and, and, and a false thinking. Because arguably we can see it even in the beginning in Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve sin. They're, they're suddenly aware that they're naked. They're afraid. They're hiding from God. And God calls their name and brings them back into to this journey of restored relationship. Mercy. He provides clothing for them. Mercy. And then he provides them direction and instruction in life that they'll now live again with mercy. But also very early in, in the context of God's dealing with his people, with the Israelite nations, who will represent all faithful people to him in all times. We'll see in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, where God inspires the, the record of how he's interacted with his people. When the Israelites are in bondage to slavery, <laughs> they're in a place where they're, they're just needing mercy. They need help. They need what we were talking about, the, that other translation earlier said they're in misery and during those many days the king of egypt died and the people of israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help their cry for rescue from slavery came up to god and that's key and that's significant and even you're listening ties back to that question of the beginning of this message is what do you want god to do for you so the israelites called out for god in exodus 2 and some people would say, oh, well, he's a God of judgment and anger. And that's wrong. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of who God is. That is the characteristics that we look at. That is, it goes on that their cry for rescue for slavery came up to God. And then verse 23 goes into 24. It says, and God heard their groaning. God heard. He's listening. He's paying attention. And God remembered his covenant, his promised relationship with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God saw the peace or people of Israel and God knew. I'm saying that God knew what they were going through. He knew their misery. And so as the God of compassion and mercy, he's about to act. And for those of us that are looking for some extra homework, that are serious about pursuing God, I invite you, if you haven't been into Exodus for a while, read into Exodus 2 and then into Exodus 3, so that when Moses encounters the burning bush, it's not in and of itself a story, but it's tied directly to the crying out, the groaning of the Israelites in their misery. They say, God, we want you to do this. And the merciful God acts in mercy. And we want to offer that because God is compassionate, he acts with compassion. Or as one commentator put it, said, God's compassion leads him to actively compassionate. They say it's a verb, and so not one that I would use to be compassionate. That there's the noun right? That he is compassionate. And then to be compassionate, the verb, to act with compassion. So that he sends Moses to deliver the children of Israel. And this is a reflection on who God is. And Exodus 2 is trying to get it there for it so as we can still see on the screen. God saw the people of Israel after hearing them, and he knew, and he acted and responded. And Jesus, who came to earth, and he came to reveal the Father's heart, came to reveal the Father's plan, we see this same idea of action in him. That in Mark 6, 34, Jesus, in the midst of his teaching and his, and his ministry, he was in a boat, and then when he came ashore, he saw a great crowd. And the Spirit records for us that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, which is just a great metaphor, but it also means they needed a leader. They needed spiritual leading and guidance. They needed spiritual healing, healing. They needed hope. They had many things that we could say they had on their heart that if God said, what do you want me to do for you? They would answer this and this. And so Jesus, it says, he began to teach them many things. So that the teaching of Jesus, not just in Mark 6 to that crowd, but offer even for us as we're journeying with this in this message, as we journey through this series of messages, we want to grow in becoming like Christ and how he wants us to live, is that his teaching is an act of compassion. It's an act and reflection of who our Heavenly Father is as a God who is merciful. And that Jesus reveals the Father's heart by having compassion. And then his compassion moved him to action, so they began to teach. 
And then I'll offer that there's something, there's an application that's, that's tucked away in here that Jesus' teaching as an act of compassion to his disciples includes later on at the end of his gospels, and each of them will have a ver variation of the commission to go and make disciples, to go and be compassionate on other people. But as, as we offer this relationship that, that we see with God to the Israelites, just before he sends Moses, that he hears them. Even Jesus, when he sees the crowd, he has compassion on them like a sheep without a shepherd. Very relational language in the, the ancient Near East, the way shepherds work, and he teaches them with compassion. But I think there's an invitation for us that God is the father of mercies, and God's children can trust in his compassion. That there's a relationship in there that God is the father of mercies, would invite his children, that God's children can trust in him and trust in his compassion. Now, earlier we had looked at the second Corinthians passage. We'll just pull that up again for us. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one sense we can hang on, oh, God's the father of Jesus Christ. It's great to have a relationship. But then it goes on, he's the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Again, this idea, you could argue that comfort's another variation, a word on this idea of mercy and compassion for those that just required it. And if you haven't done it for a while, offer there's, there's an application, there's a homework for some of us to go into 1 Corinthians. You can read in first, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, that idea of God's comfort. And the way he's comforting his people, that he's expressing his heart as the Father of mercies, he sent Jesus Christ. As the father of mercies, he's not just up there and having feelings of compassion, but he's acting in compassion into the lives of his people, into their experiences, into their days. And again, from that psalm that we'd read at the beginning of this message, in verse 13 of Psalm 103, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Now, at least for those that I, I would presume are watching, that are part of our church, that I know that are parents, this idea that as a father shows compassion to his children, we get and we understand. And even those that have had a bad experience with their own personal earthly father, we still know this, that there should be a compassion. So that there's this invitation for us to respond to the Lord as the one who shows compassion to those who fear him. As we talk about fear him, we want to hang on. That that biblical idea isn't one that we hold on to terror. It's, it's not, it's not a, a, a overwhelming sense of dread, but it's a sense that we live with honor, respect, and obedience and love to our Father. So I think as, as we process this, there's an application, there's an invitation for us. I know I've been wrestling it for myself with this message. To ask how I've been processing this relational aspect have I been relating to him as a child? Have, have I really? That, that, that as a father shows to his children, so the father shows compassion. And I want to say yes, and in general, I do believe the theme of my life is yes, I respond to that. Or have I been responding as something different? Sometimes I drift off to God who's distant or judgy or angry, even as we talked a little bit last week with justice. But there's an invitation here. That God shows, not just knows and feels, but shows, acts, reveals compassion to those who love him. And then that idea of those who fear God, that there's a relational part, those that are his children, they're living in relationship with Jesus. And the Father is that, have I been living with honor, respect, obedience, and love? What the word, the biblical word fear invites me to do. And for those that are part of our church that we know, Allison Alliance Church's vision is that we say we, we, we will be dedicated followers of Jesus Christ who live as Christ wants us to live. To say we follow Jesus is to embrace his teaching, even the mercy and the compassion that he had on the crowd in Mark 6. And that we don't just hear and know, but that we start to live out his teaching. And living the way he wants us to live is, is included in part of this idea of fearing God not in, not, in, not in cowering, but in embracing and honor and respect. So how have we been doing that? And then for those of us, again, that are part of Allison Alliance Church, that we embrace as one of our values that we grow in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So it'd be real easy to say, yes, I agree with this idea. I agree with everything we've covered so far and just file it away in our head and move on. But there's an invitation to grow near and close 
to the Father of compassion, the Father of mercy who wants to show His mercy and His compassion to us. And then I think that as we do that, as we realize the invitation that there's, as a father shows compassion to His children, the Lord's compassion shows compassion to those who fear Him, that to those who live in relationship with Him as our Father, that those who live as His children, we can claim some of his promises. Now, even as I say that, let's be clear, God is compassionate to all people, but it's those who live in relationship with him that it can enter fully without hindrance, without blockage, into receiving the promises of his compassion and his mercy for us and to us. And the Psalm 103 picked on that. We see it a little bit later in the last couple of verses. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, without end, everlasting to everlasting, to those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. And for those of us who have children and, and are an extended families and, and grandkids and, and we want to influence others, it's like we, we believe that God's goodness flows towards our family as we follow him. It's not a promise that he'll keep everything safe and perfect. Everyone gets to make their own choice to follow God or not. But there's an invitation, there's a promise there that God works and shows compassion and mercy to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Here's, I think, just another way of saying what we've already covered. If we say we want to live the way Jesus wants us to live, are we? Are we engaging his teaching? Are we letting it change us and wrestle with it? As we go through this series for those that are part of our church over the summer, are we letting God speak to us and say, change me where you need to change me? And then I think as we look at the context of the psalm, <laughs> that God knows how much I need mercy. How much I need it, and it talks about even earlier, it's on that God knows our frame. He knows how prone we are to blowing it. He knows how prone we are to making mistakes, to, to just wandering. And he's always looking to reveal his mercy to me right there. He's going to reveal his mercy to you right there. So the question is, am I ever ready to receive his mercy, his compassion, his goodness to me? So I think that leads us as, as we sort of come to, to real sharp application of this message is that we can ask God to reveal himself as my Father of mercy. Not just God of mercy out there, but ask God to reveal himself as my Father of mercy. Reveal himself as the God and the Father of mercy to me. Now, I think we can see this and just pick a couple of things so we don't miss the, the strength of this. Is that Jesus himself taught this. He was trying to teach response to God, the Father of mercies, to the Israelites and to the people Speaking of just a religious person that's all self-righteous that doesn't need to call out to God saying they've got their life together. Instead, they go to a tax collector. It's a person that's sold out their, their culture and their religion and their people and they're seen in their culture as the, the lowest of the low, right? Those that, you know, have a different opinion on socioeconomic medical vaccine states than you, you know, than, than me. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And there's a deep cry that Jesus is teaching by this example. He's saying this individual went leaving, having received what he asked of God, that God responded to him. And there's a whole sense there where we can repeat that prayer, and many have done it throughout church history, sort of a liturgy and just repetition, not really expecting it. But the invitation that Jesus is giving here in Luke is to say, we can call out and expect to meet God and he will meet us. And maybe, just maybe, some of us need to give some serious attention to this. Is Are we willing to call out to God for his mercy? For his mercy, his action, his compassion. And again, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Mercy is, is his acting when we need it in life where we are just accountable to him and sometimes we tuck away those things and i've been a believer so many years and i've talked to so many other believers that i think many of us have probably tucked some stuff away and maybe today is the day that jesus is inviting us to say god be merciful to me a sinner and then i'm going to be offered that jesus did not just teach this teaching but he responded to many times to people calling out to him for mercy and just one such example of this, as, as he was teaching, there was a couple of, of, of blind men calling out to him and the, cr the crowd, they were saying, oh, you're just rebukes them. These guys are crying out. They're making a scene, right? They're, 
the language of the Psalms, they were undignified, right? They were calling out. The crowd rebukes them, like, shh, be quiet. I mean, that's not acceptable around us, right? The, the crowd rebukes them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more. I love that passion. Lord, have mercy on us, crying out, yelling, screaming, making a spectacle even. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? I, I love this dynamic. I love that it's there, that the crowd doesn't encourage them. The crowd indeed stifles them and shuts them down. And in a world where we see cancel culture, where we see social pressures saying this and that, and we're worried about offending, we're worried about all kinds of things of others. These men in calling out to God desperately just needed God to respond to them. They needed his mercy. And Jesus responds to it, that when the crowd tells them to be silent, they cry out all the more, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? That their need, and I'm going to offer their faith and their trust, their daring to believe that Jesus is the son of David, that he is the one that will have mercy on them. No one in the crowd might, but Jesus will. That they need to call out. One commentator in this whole area, this process, as I was reading through it, said, don't pity yourself. Don't be afraid to tell God your troubles. And then he references, there's a little song that says, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But there's somebody who knows all right. There's somebody who knows all right, says this commentator. And don't pity yourself. And I'll confess, just as I processed that, as I heard that comment, I needed to read that for me. But I think in our world, in our culture, where we've amplified self-help and self-expression and self-demands and the idea of a consumeristic culture, that if, if my shopping store, if my grocery store, if my dentist, if my church doesn't meet my needs and do the things the way I want, I'm going to leave. And it's like, woe is me. That this commentator is saying, we don't need to have self-pity. We need to just cry out to God that he already knows. Go back and look at what Psalm 103 is telling us, that he knows our frame. And that Jesus, as for many of us that have journeyed since Easter message, that Jesus is interceding for us, means he's speaking up on our behalf right now. He wants to have mercy. I think we, we could arguably extend and say, part of his interceding is going, God, here's what they need. And then coming to us and saying, what do you want me to do for you? that I think we can cry out for mercy like those that did in the gospel, not in hopelessness, but in an expectant faith that he will work. And honestly, I'll say is, as God has worked on me this week with this, with this message and the wording with some of the stuff, he's challenged me and he's challenged my thinking in this, that will I call out to him in expectant faith and expecting that he will indeed show me mercy, show me compassion because that's who he is. And I say that not to throw my journey out there, but I think I'm typical. I think there's many that are listening to our message this morning that would have that same thing. The need a fresh ear to hear Jesus saying to you, what do you want me to do for you? Right now, right here. So as we come to the communion elements, I'll pray for a bit, we'll receive the broken body of Christ for us, his shed blood for us, that represent his body going to the cross for our sins, but then the resurrection life as he comes to life and gives us new life and then is ascending and being at the right hand of the Father, interceding, asking that question, what do you want me to do for you? So as we come to these elements, and indeed when we go to our response song, the Revelation song where we sing, worthy is the Lamb. And then we will honor him, we'll glorify him. He's holy and he sits on the throne. He sits on the mercy seat. Dear one, I, I don't know what you're wrestling with this morning. I'll, I'll know what I'm wrestling with. And God's put his, his, his hand of invitation out to me for a few things this week. And, and I'll confess, I'm coming to the communion elements this morning, trying to have that expectancy, hearing him say, Todd, what do you want me to do for you? So I don't know what you have, but I deeply believe Jesus is extending to you as we come to the communion elements, the invitation that he wants you as we come to the bread and the cup to receive from him fresh mercy. The passage that I'll read for communion this morning is Isaiah's foreshadowing, prophesying, as the Spirit speaks through prophet Isaiah about what Jesus would do on the cross for us. 
Isaiah 53, 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him not. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. And we, like sheep, have all gone astray. We've all turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes, we are healed again, dear one. We've all gone astray, and the Lord has taken on our stripes. He's taken on our healing. So as we come to the cup, to the bread, to the cracker this morning, there's a reminder, he's taken all of our stuff. Would we in faith go to him and receive his taking it, and then his offering mercy? That he's, I deeply believe for some of us, in, in some significant ways even, he wants us to call it to him in mercy and compassion when he says, what do you want me to do for you? Would you allow me to pray and then partake with me? Fathers, we come to this cracker, this bread, and this cup representing your body and your blood for us, that you've taken all of our iniquities, all of our sins, and that you offer us so much in exchange that as we wander away, you offer to call us back. Lord Jesus, I, I, I know you're speaking to me, well, some stuff that you want to offer me mercy on, some compassion on, and the invitation is for me to receive it from you. So allow me to do it even as I receive the cup this morning. And then even as we go to the song this morning, say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us on heaven's mercy seat. Help us to receive from you. So Lord, I pray for the dear one this morning, whatever they're wrestling with, whether it's an external thing, a circumstance they need change, would you give them mercy? a financial burden that you need to provide for, would you do it? Lord, some may have physical healing. They need you to move in their bodies in miraculous ways. And some of us, Lord, I think many of us have inner hurts or stuff's just weighing us down. We're broken. And once again, in fresh ways, we need to encounter your mercy and your compassion. Come, O Lord, and work even as we've been speaking, as we've worshiped you this morning, as we continue on receiving this bread and this cup. So we thank you for this cup the body of Christ broken for us, or the bread broken for us. We thank you for this cup, the blood of Christ shed for us. And as we partake them, Lord, we do so in faith, receiving your life, and indeed, as an act of faith, receive your mercy and your compassion. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You have your bread and your cracker. Would we join together and receive the body of Christ broken for us? In the same way, we can receive the cup, the shed blood of Christ for us. Giving us, not just forgiveness of sins, but so much life, so much mercy and compassion. Will we receive it and receive in faith all that he would have and do for us today? In Jesus' name. Dear one, as we go to our response song this morning, I invite for you to continue to respond to God. And if, you, if he's doing some bigger stuff in your watching the video, pause if it's not live stream, and then just carry on with the, the, the response song when you're ready. But as we go to the song, respond to God, call out to him and receive from him all that he has for you because he is the father of mercies and he wants you to receive his mercy and his compassion today. Would you do that? As we bring our service to a close today, we're just going to sing one more song of praise to the King of Kings to the Lord of Lords. You know, a scripture tells us that all of creation is longing for his return to restore everything to how it should be. And just this time of, of taking communion together reminds us that, that Jesus said he's waiting. He's waiting for us with a table that's spread. And someday we'll be sitting at the, at the table with the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ the Lord. 
and we'll be celebrating together in his presence. What a day that'll be. But for now, as much as we can, we're just going to sing to him. With everything in us that we have, we're going to sing our praises to him while we wait for him to return. I 
sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Final word for us, a good word from God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.